What's up? Welcome here to Lacrosse Now. I'm Travis Eldridge. He's Tom Eschen. A lot to get to on today's show, including a couple of terrific guests. We got Harvard's Jerry Byrne coming off a big win over BU and uh, Taylor Moreno from North Carolina talking about what it's like to stand in there as a goalie mm. against Charlotte North. And oh. She's got a great answer yeah, there. Great stuff there from Coach Byrne as well, coming off a big win, a couple of big wins for them. Um, we got quick picks for the women's game looking ahead to this weekend. But today's kind of a special day right, in terms of the premiere of The Office, which happened how many years ago? 17, 17 years, ago years ago today on NBC, The Office debuted. So we've got some quotes for you, and we'll pair those with some matchups, teams galore. Should be a lot of fun. But we're going to start with our midweek moment, as we do every Thursday. Why don't you kick us off? All what's, right. What's your midweek moment? Matchup of the week, in my estimation, men or women. It's the women we go to, the top 10 matchup between Loyola and Princeton. This one was as advertised. Games of runs in the second half. Loyola winning 16-15. to They're now 8-0, and handing Princeton their first loss of the year. Nina Montez for Princeton scores it to make it 16-15. So that sets up a huge draw control with like 1 minute 34 seconds to go. The rain is falling. Livy Rosenzweig gets the draw. Loyola is able to run that one out. Katie Detweil in this game. Three, five draw controls, three cause turnovers. She was awesome. Georgia Latch, three goals, three assists for Loyola. Loyola getting the job done, and they haven't lost yet. So let, let's see this train keep on rolling. It's an impressive team. They got the win over Florida that continues to look more and more impressive after the Gators knocked off uh, Syracuse last week uh, Last week in a midweek game. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all in on the Hounds. Princeton's got to write that defense up. They, they've yeah. allow, allow, they're allowing a lot of goals right now. If they want to be in that contender category, at least to try to make it to the Final Four, then they've got to uh, step things up on that end. Well, speaking of excitement, my midweek moment, a battle in Boston that we had uh, here in our backyard at Harvard, and it was a 13-10 win for Harvard over BU. This was a top-20 matchup on a Tuesday, a terrific atmosphere, almost 2,000 fans at Jordan Field for this one on a Tuesday night. And as you would expect, if you know the recent history of these two teams, it was back and forth. Tied one goalie, tied one goalie. Nobody led by more than two until Harvard took a uh, three-goal lead very late in the third quarter. But then BU responded by scoring two to start the fourth to make it a one-goal game again. Harvard finally able to pull away uh, thanks to a couple of good plays in the ride, able to stretch it out to, to win 13-10. to 10. But this was as good as advertised. Harvard, their second win over a ranked team over the course of four days because they beat Brown on Saturday. They come back and beat BU on Tuesday. This Harvard team is really good. We're going to talk to Jerry Byrne in a bit, mm -hmm. a, a little bit more about this game and about this squad. But it was a gritty, feisty win for the Crimson. Yeah, another win for the Ivy League out of conference play, being yep. in a Patriot League team there in BU and, and BU, getting maybe a little more battle-tested for when things really begin in the Patriot League. They already have begun, but things are going to ratchet themselves up here soon for BU to, to get kind of locked and loaded for this. I think that was a good test for them, and now they can work on things moving forward. And, and that's good to get some lumps here, too, before. And quite frankly, two teams that I think expect to compete to make their conference tournaments and. Two teams that, you know, anything can happen in both the Patriot League and the yeah. Ivy League. Yep. So, They're uh, contenders there, at least for, for now. For sure. Yeah, Absolutely. at least at this point at the end of March. All right. Let's turn our attention to The Office. Mm. Because you mentioned 17 years ago today, The Office mm. debuted. And so in, uh, in honor of that, <laughs> we are going to have some quotes that are going to relate to some games this weekend. So let's kick it off with a quote from none other than the Michael Scott. And it's sometimes they start a sentence and I don't even know where it's going. I just hope I find it along the way. Hmm. That, Season five, the duel. That's when he's in um, David Wallace's David, office. Yeah, yeah. And he's trying to explain. He's saying don't do anything to anyone anywhere at any time for whatever reason. That, and then he sort of goes on from there. I think he also finishes his spaghetti yeah. before he leaves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you should. Right. He, he earned that spaghetti. He did. For sure. So it's really what, hard to What you know, game does this figure quote out who make you, are. you think of? I'm going to go, I'm going to go with a team, uh, and, and then we'll look at the game accordingly. Ohio State at Rutgers. And this sort of is the way we talked about this on Tuesday quite a bit in which Ohio State, I'm like, yeah, they've been kind of inconsistent this year because you look back, go, go to their game against Dartmouth on Tuesday. 
Tied 6 to 6 at the half. Dartmouth has been a solid Ivy League team. And OSU in the second half goes out 6 to nothing to finish the game. They win 12 to 6. So that up and down. They start the season 4 and 0. Wins over North Carolina and Harvard, a team we were just talking yep. about. They lose the Cornell. They beat Notre Dame. They lose the Denver. It's like they don't really know where things are going, and then they right the ship a little bit. So it's been a little bit of a head scratcher, and I think that we might get an answer in this game against Rutgers, possibly, and I, you don't know, really know what you're going to get, and I think that they will find their way at the end of the day. They'll, they'll find the end of the sentence so to compare it once again. <laughs> Something that's been plaguing them in terms of the consistency. They're struggling in the clear, right around 57th in the nation in that middle of the pack in turnovers. And there is a person, Colby Smith, he's taken 72 shots for them. That leaves the team only shooting 31%. Around national, that's about 150. So a, a guy that they expect to score a little bit more has to be a little bit more efficient for them to get that consistency on the offensive end alongside guys like Jack Myers. Let's just hope they don't have to start their own paper company in order to mm. figure out where the sentence goes. Uh, and yeah. The season goes. Uh, nice. Good one. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't know how that compares, but sure. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna go with a game for uh for this one. Kay. And it's Army at Loyola. Because both teams in a very similar fashion, it's kind of like what are we gonna get? Because for Loyola, they started uh the season by losing four in a row. Against good teams. Against good teams, yes, but they lost four in a row and the the Towson loss is probably the one that that's glaring as a huh, I'm not sure what to make of this. And then they respond by winning three straight. And I think not only is it the results, but it's kind of what the players have done on the field after what they did last year that's also a little bit head-scratching. Because Sam Schaefer, who was a terrific goalie down the stretch last year, one of the reasons they made that run in the NCAA tournament, this game, this past game against Bucknell was the first time he had double-digit saves all season long. He had been pulled in the first couple of games mm. against very good opponents, but pulled... And they won that game against Duke without him making double-digit saves. And now he finally kind of settles in. So, for me, Loyola is a bit of a head-scratcher. And then you look at Army. And Army has been impressive at times this year. Top 10, in, in, Top 10 up in the until country. last week. Yeah. yeah. But the, the loss to Rutgers, not quite as puzzling. But then they lost to Lehigh in a game where, while Lehigh had an edge at the face-off X, it wasn't crazy. It's not like Michael Sisselberger for Lehigh won 90% of the faceoffs. No, yeah. it, it was a scrum there. It was a battle. And so the loss to Lehigh after what the expectations were at that point of the year, a bit of a head scratcher to me. I mean, I know it's the Patriot League. This thing's going to be wide open. In this Army Loyola game, watch the faceoff X once again because Army, when they have been on, they're only two, the only two times they've lost this year, they've been held to just 10 goals. Yeah. Every other game they've been way up. They're the seventh best scoring offense in the country. If Loyola and Bailey Savio can have a strong advantage at the X, take possessions away from Army, and I, that has to be the game plan here for Loyola and Charlie Toomey, if that's the case, Loyola's got a good shot to win. Yeah, and you got Cam Wires on the other end for Loyola in this yeah. game, and, and Brendan Nick turns second in the nation in points per game. It's to me, like you said, the games in which Army's been successful and the games are in which they are scoring more goals, it's the guys around Nick Turn. Nick Turn's getting yes. the job done, especially in this kind of a case. Uh, you, you need that from other sources other than just Nick Turn. And don't forget, you got Brent. Um, uh, Ryan McNulty, as well as a long stick midfielder who can match up with, with just about anybody yeah. in the country, too. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, let's move on to the next quote. I'll take this one. Yeah, what do you got? Would I rather be feared or loved? Easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's from season two, the fight. Once again, Michael Scott. Yeah. Take it away, Travis. I'm going to go with Georgetown. Okay. Because this is a team, I mean, everybody was talking about Georgetown coming into the year. Because on top of the fact that they were a terrific team last year, they added all these transfers. Will Bowen comes in defensively. It's a team that everybody felt like could score as well. They've got the best goalie in the country coming in. Two of the best close defensemen in the country. Terrific face-off guy. And so I think it's everybody, like every, everybody nationally just, just wants to give Georgetown a hug. I'm like, not that he needed it, because I think they're, they're doing pretty well, but everyone wants to give them a hug. However, got a game against Lehigh this week that I think is going to be really interesting. And once again, the face-off matchup is going to be tremendous. You've got Sisselberger, who's up around 69% on the year. He's second in the country in face-off win percentage against James Riley of Georgetown, who's fourth in the country at 65%. Two of the top four guys in the country dueled it out. 
Whoever has the edge there, does it go one way or the other? Does it swing in terms of dominance? Will be really interesting. And this Georgetown team has a really tricky stretch here because as good as they've been, they've got wins over Hopkins, Penn, and Notre Dame. They got a trip to Lehigh here this week and then to Georgetown or to Denver to start Big East play. Those two games are not easy. So I think we're going to figure out just how good Georgetown will be here down the stretch in these next couple of weeks because this is probably the biggest stretch for them in terms of rest of the way of, of really strong challenges. So I need to be afraid of how much I love them heading into that. Yeah. Right. If you're gonna, I'm a little, you know, you like know. if these are they're two tricky games, two road trips, yeah. including a trip out west. Yeah, I think that Lehigh Georgetown game is the one a lot of people are watching this weekend. And and I mean Denver just beat Ohio State. Yeah. They, they, maybe they've right. turned the corner. The, the, you yeah, know? It's, it's possible. Yeah, we had Jack Hanna on earlier we this did. week talking he's about got confidence. Just that. Yeah, he does. Uh, he's been playing a lot better too, yeah. which has been a big part of their All recent right. success. Who who's loving well, I'm going specifically to this weekend and it's Princeton, now number two in the nation, going to Yale. So <laughs> I mean <laughs> you got, you, people are loving Princeton after that track meet twenty one twenty against Penn last weekend. Yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. But then you go to Yale. And, yeah, everyone's high on Princeton now. But I'd be a little bit fearful of going into that territory against a Yale team who maybe played one of their best halves, one of their best runs of the season. Maybe I can just go to that fourth quarter as they were down. So Yale allows an eight-goal run in between the second and the third. Yep. They score seven of the last eight against Cornell, a team that we are pretty high on defensively more than anything else, I'd say, this year. So – I think maybe Yale's feeling a little bit better about life, despite the fact that they lost that game. And Jared Paquette, their goalie, 18 saves in that game. He's had 15 or more saves four times this year. So when you look at that matchup, that is not one that Princeton can go sleep on and expect to go score 21 goals again by any stretch of the imagination. And also, Yale's got some of those weapons coming on up with that attack unit, Brandau, alongside the freshman, Leo Johnson. And, and I think that... Yale yeah, definitely has a chance to knock off the number two team in the nation. I would be very, this is, I'd be very wary if you're Princeton riding high heading into Yale, deep in enemy territory. Well, you know what this almost feels like to make another offense reference? It feels like when Charles Minor comes in and takes control of the Scranton branch, mm. Yale's the Michael Scott. He leaves, and he can maybe struggle a little bit at the beginning of the year. Everybody's kind of off the bandwagon. But this is the battle between the new up-and-comer, Princeton's the, the Charles Minor, mm. and Michael Scott, who goes out and starts Michael Scott Paper Company, but then comes back, sells the company back, mm. and then takes retakes over control, in this case, of the Ivy League, not this, the uh, Dunder Mifflin Scranton branch. Right, yeah. So I, 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 this, this has a feel of... The old, the team that's been the top, Yale, mm. against the team that, feel, like, so far this year, feels like the best team in the league. This is going to be really intriguing who comes out on top. That was wonderful. I couldn't have said it any okay. better. What a comparison. You're welcome. Well done. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> all right, I'll take this one. Travis is all in on this segment. I am. This I is... did not expect all of this. <laughs> You're welcome. The next go one on. is one of the best quotes. And it, uh, it's in... in reference to that same conflict in the show. It is. Yeah. And it's, uh, well, 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 how the turntables, <laughs> Michael Scott emerging yes, this, with the this is Michael they, Scott Paper Company. This is when they heard that they want to offer the Michael Scott Paper Company a, a buyout, if you will. And $60,000. $60,000, yes. <laughs> um, I will start this one. Yeah, what you got? I'm going Notre Dame at Virginia. And it almost feels like the tables are turning on maybe these two seasons as Virginia, they weren't number, they were number one in the nation the preseason. Maryland overtook them, but yep. Virginia was still part of that sort of top two tier teams. And then Virginia sort of lays an egg, let's be honest, against Maryland last time out. And yes, Virginia has nice wins over Johns Hopkins and North Carolina. But in the grand scheme of things, those aren't nearly as impressive as maybe they looked at the time. So for Virginia, yes, they're very talented top to bottom. We know they're defending champions for a reason. But it feels like right now they're sort of figuring things out and plateauing a little. Meanwhile, you got Notre Dame on the other end. Coming off a nice win over Michigan. I know it's not at the 
biggest win in the world, but it's a confidence building when you shut down a really good offense in that as well. 12 to 7 was the win there. You've got the Kavanaugh's who are playing well. Liam Entman, we talked about saves earlier. He had 19 saves against Michigan. We know he's going to be tested here against Virginia, against another good offense. So I have a lot of confidence in him to be able to get the job done. And the way Notre Dame won that game against Michigan, talked about it on Tuesday, they can lose some faceoffs. They're fine with it. Let the defense go to work. That's true. And, uh, they just and, don't care. And, and they can be okay. Obviously, Virginia has a different style and a better uh, offense, but Michigan had played some good offense this year. I'm not comparing the two, but still, very, Virginia has a very talented offense. But Notre Dame, I feel like now they're feeling after getting their lumps early in the season, starting to gain some of that confidence back. You get one win under your belt, and now you get one that sort of turns the table on your season right here right now yeah no I, I, huge game in the ACC is for a, a Notre Dame team that that win over Michigan was gigantic now can you follow it up mm. and then, I mean you, you mentioned for Virginia like what ha do you, would you this can go one of two ways it's either Virginia returns to form and is as dominant as we've seen them be against just about a, other teams in the country or it's they still aren't playing in May yet, and it's just cruise control. Yeah, and they had 17 turnovers against Maryland, too. That yeah. I know Maryland is who they are. We'll talk about them in a second. But that concerns me a little bit, especially with the amount of time Virginia probably is going to have the ball in this one. And sometimes yeah. you see some of these teams, they win a lot of face-offs, but they turn it over a lot. They can't keep it as often as they have it. So that, to me, if, if Virginia is going to win a lot of face-offs, they're going to have to keep possession here and, and not let that defense get to them. And Notre Dame, another team, you can't dig yourself into a deep hole no. and expect to get out of it against yeah. that team. Like, it's you when know. they get clicking, right. when they get rolling, you don't want to get in front of that train. Anyway. Just uh, like the Michael Scott Paper Company, you know, in its heyday. In its heyday. All like three weeks that they were in existence. <laughs> Lowest uh, prices in town. Speaking, <laughs> that's why you can't stay in business. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm going to stay in the ACC for mine. Be, and I'm going to go with Duke at Syracuse. How things have changed over the course of mm. like two years. I mean, normally, Duke at Syracuse is the game of the weekend. Usually yeah. two top ten teams, maybe two top five teams, one and two in the country. We're looking at a, a team that's in outside of the top ten in Duke, but ranked against an unranked Syracuse team. I mean, how different does this game feel than just about every other one? Like, I want to, I mean, even as a Syracuse alum, I want to be hyped up about the opportunity Syracuse has in the Carrier Dome with, with Duke coming in. But it just doesn't feel the same. It's not the same oomph to it because of where these two programs are at the moment. The one thing to, to look at, or a couple of things to look at in this one. One for Syracuse against Stony Brook. It was another kind of slow start on the road. They were tied uh, right around the halftime against the Seawolves. Scored nine second-half goals. Maybe that starts to light a fire under this offense. Tucker Dordovic, five of his six goals were after halftime in that win over Stony Brook over the weekend, when they had to have the Syracuse needs Tucker Dordovic to do that. I mean, you, you mentioned it. What was it two weeks ago going into uh, a big game for Syracuse? Out Virginia against Virginia. Virginia. Yeah. Tucker needed to show up. He, he needs to show up every week for this team. On the other side for Duke, Brendan O'Neill finally kind of burst out against Townsend. Nine points on three goals and six assists. He's got 13 combined goals in his last three games. Wow. Maybe as a sophomore, and he's got a little bit more of attention than he ever did as a freshman because obviously Michael Sowers is there. Maybe he's starting to figure this out, and what does that mean for Duke moving forward? Can this be the momentum that Duke needs to turn into the team we, I think, expected them to be at the end of the year? Yeah, and it... it I don't really have a lot of faith in either of these defenses. I, I think this is going to be a pretty high-scoring game, which might behoove Syracuse a little bit more, or get rocking and rolling in the dome a little bit. Yeah. It just feels, we were talking about this before, it kind of feels like a game Syracuse wins, right? It, it does. <laughs> I, my concern with Syracuse, it, A, it's can you stop anybody? Right, yeah, um, you, it's especially Duke. Yeah. It, but can Duke, I mean, if Syracuse can get some of that momentum on the offensive side, they're a much different team. You're right. You know, they, when they've played some tougher defenses this year, that's when they've just been able to they sort of... But they've of, also lost some shootouts. Like, you yeah. look at that Army game, you lost a shootout that you had true control of late. Like, they haven't shown that Syracuse mentality of, okay, even if we're down a couple of goals, we're going to come back and overtake them. 
or be able to hold on late. That's the proof. That's what I need from Syracuse to see. I guess I'm going to throw all the stats aside. Yeah. I'm just saying it feels like a game Syracuse wins. Okay. <laughs> right? It, you can give me I'm, the stats you're, right. you're blue in the face. I just feel it feels like a game Syracuse would win. I mean, you look at you look at the series and, history and how wild it's been. Yeah. Syracuse has won this game in, in other years when they needed it. Is, yeah. is well, the game the Syracuse that's needs. That's the thing about uh, the Loyola win over Duke yeah. this year. And that was the game that Loyola needed to springboard their season. And it almost feels like this is a similar scenario for Syracuse in which they got to like, okay, time to wake up, guys. This is it. I mean, Duke might need it for, as well. Duke that does same, it. And that both these way. teams need but, it. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just kind of feels like a game Syracuse wins. That's just, right. just me. Okay. They might lose by 10 Maybe goals. Maybe we'll come back to this on, <laughs> on Tuesday. We'll see. Um, so the turntables have, um, as we move on here. Turned. So we have one final here. Yep. Um, do you want me to take this one? Yeah, yeah. You, you go with the quote. This is Dwight Schrute. How would I describe myself? Three words. Hardworking, alpha male, jackhammer, merciless, insatiable. <laughs> we even left more than. Out. Yeah. More than three words. Yeah. Um, yeah. So but that's the point. We are both going to choose the same exact team for this one. And there was only one team that say, and that's Maryland. Yeah. Far and wide after what they did against Virginia, the best team in the country. They, what, there's nobody been within five goals of them all year. Something like that. Yeah. And I think Princeton's the closest. I think it was a five goal difference. I mean, that's how much better they've been. And they've, and it's not like they're dominating teams that aren't in the top five. They've beat the team, beaten the teams that are, ranked right behind them in the national rankings that have then proven it elsewhere. Yeah. I guess Virginia probably has a little bit more to prove in terms of their strength to schedule. But uh, George, to, or excuse me, Princeton has certainly proven it elsewhere in terms that they deserve to be up there. That's why they're the number two team in the country right now, not Virginia. Yeah, Maryland, number one offense in the nation, and they have a two-goal, right around two-goal separation from Princeton, who's second in the nation in offense. 11th best, de 11 best defense in the nation, too. And their offense is really interesting because you got Logan Misnauskas there, and he's sixth in the country in points per game this year. He's got 23 goals, 17 assists. They have eight players who have double-digit points this year. And, and yeah, Misnauskas going in wearing the number one, and there was so much that surrounded that. But it, it doesn't like doesn't scream Jared Bernhardt by any stretch of the imagination. But at the same time, it almost feels like they have gotten, if not stayed the same, gotten a little bit better at, with those transfers and, and just the makeup of the team. I'm thinking Torton wise. Yeah. You know, moving forward, I guess Wisnowskis, because he's on the best team and they, they looks like they're going to make a run, will be able to be the front runner there. But I don't know. It just doesn't seem like a traditional, at this point at the end of March, like he is that far and away ahead of everybody else just because of the no. rest. His team has almost overshadowed how I, good he's been. Yeah. And actually, I want to do this. Maybe next week we'll do this. Our top five, like, Torton yeah. players right now, because I think it's a very open race. There haven't been a lot of individual stars on these elite teams that have really like taken hold of that. And so I think that's something that's going to happen throughout conference play. I will say, I do think this Maryland team is better than last year. Like you, I know you removed Jared Bernhardt from it, but in terms of what they added and the depth of scoring and their experience. I, yeah. I do think this is better. Like, or, like you think about that national championship game last year, the feeling was if Jared Bernhardt didn't, like, go above and beyond for Maryland. They're not winning the national championship. And Jared Bernhardt did everything in his power yeah, to try to win that game. He nearly did. Yeah. But that was the feeling. This year, like, it does feel like Logan Wisnowskis could have a, a game where he's not going off for 3-2 and two or 3-3 three and three or whatever, and it still feels like Maryland could dominate. I think that's one of the differences between the two. Yeah, uh, yeah right. I think the makeup of their team, there's a little bit more – strength of, of depth. It's and like everybody's up here instead of having one elite and yeah. then everybody and, else. And there was fine was complimentary pieces around yeah. Bernhardt last year. And I think the I think the year of experience helps too. And you oh, got 100%. guys that were in that game, know what it takes th to get it to the job done. Don't forget, still just the end of March. Got a whole other month and a half to hey, go here. Or I, two months. I will say this weekend, Sunday night, Maryland at Penn State, white out in Happy mm -hmm. Valley. And don't sleep on Penn State. I know they're not having a good year, but they've got three straight one-goal losses. They played Penn tough 10-9. They played Cornell tough 16-15, and then they lost to Bucknell 12-11. I mean, Penn and Cornell are good teams. We talked about them. They're good teams. Yeah. Penn State has played and stayed with good teams. 
I'm not saying that they're going to win. Yeah, but you Mar predicted an upset here? No, but Maryland better be ready to go because they're going to go into a really good atmosphere and they're coming off a win where that was the game of the year for them to this point. Will this be the closest game of the season for Maryland? I think it could be. The closest game. I think it's within like three goals. All right. If you're a betting man, I guess you yeah. can lay the points. I don't know what the spread is, you but lay the points, if it's within say. three, I'm taking it. Yes. Okay. Uh, another big matchup this weekend as we wrap up our office-themed Picks is um, Harvard taking on Dartmouth um, right in the paper belt, as Michael Scott would say, you know, right around that New England corridor, you know, Stanford, Stanford, Stanford Connecticut. Connecticut. So yeah. you'd hit, be able to hit if you were a paper salesman, all those different spots along the way. If you were going to go that then direction. just come up, come up here to New England, and Nashua. Then. That's a, that's also you know, Nashua, Nashua branch. Yeah. yeah. OK, so, that is that's New Hampshire. You're right. There's also a good lacrosse game that's going to happen. And then the head coach of Harvard, Jerry Byrne, joined us to talk about that and their season thus far. So the head coach at Harvard, Jerry Byrne, joins us now coming off a big win over BU over the course of this week, 13 to 10 on Tuesday. And you tweeted out, Jerry, was it the Storo Drive Showdown or the Charles River Clash? Since you won, I think you get naming rights here to the rivalry. You know, I think it's like a horror movie. You know, you keep on naming the sequels differently. Um, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to make that a, a thing. We'd like to try to create some sort of bean pot type event. Uh, down the road. Um, so yeah, just testing out names. It, and it's <laughs> awesome because this, and even before you got there, the games have been just absolutely epic between BU and Harvard. So I, I think things can continue. You guys were back and forth on Tuesday night. It's been a fun series. They, they were, they were obviously having a great start to their year and it's, it's, it's hard to be undefeated as you know, very rarely does that, happen and i have a lot of respect for um all of those guys ryan uh, mike and judd and their guys were flying around the field it's obviously super competitive because you're two miles from each other i drive past BU on my way to work every day so i'm not saying that familiarity breeds contempt but it definitely bred you know some crazy games obviously even before i was here so that that was a you know that was a super close game, obviously a tied game in, in the fourth quarter, and we were able to make some plays at the end. Yeah, you sure did. You've been able to make plays all season long at 5-1 and one now. I guess, what's it like being back after a year and a half? I mean, you take the job, you get a half a season, you don't, you miss a season, and, and now you're back. What's it been like? I think as you get older, you get, you, if you hadn't realized it yet, you realize life is not linear, and you don't always get what you want, and things don't always go perfectly so i think that we i think we we managed the two and a half years of uh of the non-linear part of the way life can be uh with the pandemic and the ivy league's decisions and things like that and so i think we stayed really even keeled and super focused and the guys are hungry and, and driven and you know are you know are not happy with you know what, whatever the historical perception of what harvard and harvard lacrosse is about. And so I think each time we get to compete, it's a further kind of cementing of our culture and our competitiveness and, and, you know, just doing kind of little things really well, clearing well, in general, riding at a really high level, and then, you know, upperclassmen to, you know, a lot of freshmen playing, making plays when you have to, which is, which is how you win those games, you, you do the little things well, and then when the opportunity to make a, an obvious play that, uh, the fans can recognize we're ready to do that as well. So um, I think that, you know, both the Brown and the BU games were significantly imperfect from nearly every facet of the game, you know, facing off and clearing. And But we got really a lot of great saves in both games from Kyle Mullen. We battled that at the faceoff. And when, when plays need to be made, we made them. And I think that's a sign of a – a team that's developing into a, a real contender. One of the last games that I did prior to the pandemic was you guys at Holy Cross, and it was a loss in your first year. It was just your second game. And to see you guys now finally being back on the field, it almost feels like it's a different team night and day. What has changed over the course of that year and a half you got to maybe establish some sort of culture and feel of this team that you didn't have when you walked in the door for your first time in 2020? You know, I think, you know, looking back at, at that game, the, you know, we had, we had beaten a ranked UMass team the previous 
Saturday. And the, the Saturday Tuesday games are hard. They're they're unavoidable because you want to, you know, because of just the way the seasons go and the way your league schedule is laid out that you have to play these midweek games and they're they're really hard. You know, you got a two-day turnaround, you might have a mandatory day off in there. You're not going to go really that hard and and you know guys are in school and 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 those demands. So and you know that that Holy Cross team I think was very good. They were they played really a unique defense and they played they rode uh, actually they were ahead of the curve the way a lot of teams are riding right now. So we couldn't clear the ball in that game and you know and we had we had a tough we had a tough night and but you know the lesson that I or the message that I gave the team when we started even back in you know September of 2019, which is we need to find a way to be in every game with five minutes left. And because that's when you learn how to put somebody away and you learn how to hunt somebody down if you're behind. And those are culture and poise and skill and good fortune and little plays. And and so we had did that in those four games that we played, we either won by one or lost by one in all those games. So we had already developed that mindset of being in every game with five minutes to go and uh even even the game we lost this year we we were able to get the uh ohio state game down to two with you know six or seven minutes left so you know these skills you know sometimes you're the hunter sometimes you're the hunted at the end of the game and and figuring out how to to come out on the positive side of both of those scenarios is really is our kind of main objective Travis and I were texting during the game uh, the other day, and we go, this this team is just relentless uh, on both ends, defensively and offensively. You mentioned how well you did in the ride. I mean, you look at some of the stats. Alex King, a first year for you. Four goals. He had three caused turnovers in that game, too. How were you able to m- sort of uh, implement that mentality here over the last couple of years? You know, we, we ended up uh, taking an approach during, you know, the – the multiple months of the pandemic that like a lot of times, just as an example, talking about kind of riding footwork, uh, Sam and Austin Madronic and Hayden Cheek are starting attack. You know, we, we, when we gave them their agility workouts, we wanted them to do all their agilities um, from an offensive standpoint in the space where they would naturally uh, uh, do most of their work which seems kind of self-evident, but a lot of times you just go on a whatever field, your backyard or basketball court or whatever. We wanted them to do it, you know, get the mental reps and the physical reps because we were losing all those opportunities because of the pandemic. And we did the exact same thing relative to the ride footwork. And, and, you know, one of the, one of the plays, a, a critical play at the end of the BU game is when we jumped one of their defensemen and, and Hayden cheek had a split between the goalie and another guy, and he kind of faked toward the one guy, which allowed him to jump the other guy, and it created kind of a, a breakaway near open net uh, goal for us, you know, at a time where your opponent's trying to come back. So I think we we look to try to kind of not only get the reps and all the things that we ask our guys to do, but we wanted them to physically do them in the place where they would normally operate because we felt like that, even though it's not radical, there's nothing that creative about it, we – we needed to make up for lost time. And so we needed them to do all their work in the place on the field where they would normally do it. And I think that's starting to pay some dividends for us in the ride. Yeah, for sure. And, and you mentioned that goal. That goal was huge. I think it put you up a couple there late in, in that BU game and helped, helped finish that one off. You, you mentioned the Ohio State game, and, and you guys had the lead, I believe, there at the half and, and had a chance late. What did you guys learn from the second half down there in Florida that has helped you maybe close out some of these games that you've gotten the better of, whether it was a, a, the Michigan game or against Brown or BU? You know, I, th- I think no- nothing teaches like experience. You like you can do all these agilities and you can do all your film sessions. You can do all your remote things. But, you know, time and reps, real game reps are the ultimate teacher and and I think that's you know part of our kind of momentum right now is that we're you know we have we play so many young guys we have this mixture of a, a couple of guys who had game experience you know Madronic, Nick Loring, um, Austin Madronic, etc. But the, the the majority of our team 
you know, hadn't played in a lacrosse game since high school. And so when we, when we played Ohio state, which is, you know, proven out to be a really a top 10 team, you know, and again, this is not an, an excuse in, in any way, but they were, they were grown men. There were grown men on that team. And, you know, Greg Campisi, if you watch that game, was one of the best players in that game. That was his second lacrosse game since May 2019. You know, playing Chaminade in the in the in Long Island, you know, Catholic League Championship. So, you know, now you get six games under your seven games under your belt. And now it's it's not so novel anymore. You're starting to learn from your mistakes and and, and we have a consistency of practice for the longest period of time since I've been here, you know, starting in September and now we're into, into March, um, you know, closing in on April. We, we had the longest consistency since, you know, uh, September 2019 since until March 2020. So all of those kind of the, the calculus, the stew of all of that uh, coming together because that's what you need because you can only do so much film and, and lifting and, you know, drills you need to play because that's where the real pressure and the convergence of learning and learning from mistakes and things like that. And, you know, the other lesson for our young guys was, you know, I think in that game, we, we probably played 15 to 20 freshmen in that game against Ohio state is that you, you know, I think, you know, the lights were pretty bright, you know, and, and we had some short possessions and, and they took advantage of them and that allowed them to pull away, you know, at the end that in mind how difficult has it been was it even before this season to evaluate your talent and to know how good you were I'm sure you kind of went into the season we don't know you know until you get out there right I mean listen you still don't know you're, you're you know the, the season because it's I wouldn't say parity you got some some mid-majors beating legacy programs all over the place and you know you, you, you the last thing you want to do is look ahead or look you know oh if this happens and and that happens. So it's still a mystery. And, and you know, I, I keep on telling our guys, like, you know, let's find out where this is going to go. There's no there, there's no expectations other than the ones that we create for ourselves. And, and, and there is an element of kind of ignoring, you know, what, what pundits say, no, you know, present company excluded, is, you know, that what, what they're trying to infer or say about your, your program, because they're not at practice and they're not, you know, in the huddle at the end of these games. And so it, it's, it, there's an element of freedom around, let's just find out where this is going to go. I mean, nobody had any expectations for us other than the ones we established for ourselves. And, and so, so there's a, it's a liberating feeling of enjoying each other's company, competing, you know, looking at our next uh, rival and go from there. You mentioned rivals, and we have to talk about the league you're in because you guys have Dartmouth here this weekend, who I'm sure you've watched the game, competed against Ohio State uh, earlier this week really well. And then the rest of the league, everybody is just like, it feels like it's going to be an absolute slugfest. Do you compare this to like what you had to deal with in the ACC when you're at Notre Dame with all these teams, where they are nationally, and like the talent level? I, I don't, you know, I. I've only coached one Ivy League game, and if the the Brown game is any sort of indicator, I mean that was they were they were big and athletic and mature and you know competed on every inch of, of the field. So if that was any indicator, it, and, and you know, it's, yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be quite a rush to see who can make the Ivy League tournament. I, I don't spend a lot of time talking about where I used to. Be not that that's not relevant. I'm just trying to kind of be, be here and be you know present in in the team that I'm coaching. And you know, like what on some level, what I know is kind of irrelevant. You know, like when you get to the game, you you spend the whole week or the couple of days that you have to prepare. You know, you can't give them everything. You know, they're not going to know everything about their opponent. So you spend a lot of, do a lot of work about just kind of reinforcing what you're about. And, you know, and I, yeah, don't look too far ahead. You know, this is, things are going great right now. We know it's not going to be a straight line. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't compare those things because I don't have a perspective only coaching one game in my career. Uh, 
Yeah, that would be that would be a little presumptuous, assuming I'm an expert on Ivy League lacrosse. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, have you have you had a welcome to Harvard moment in the last couple of years since you got on campus? Whether it was something with the culture of the university, where you're like, "Oh, this is this is Harvard." Um. Yeah, you know, there's probably been dozens of them. We spent a lot of time when we started just kind of reminding our guys, you know, what it means to be here, like to, you know, I don't think a lot of our guys knew that, you know, eight signers of the Declaration of Independence are Harvard grads. And they're like, and, or that Harvard is 140 years older than the Declaration, you know, like, and so, and so I think, you know, one of the things that we did when we started was really kind of give our guys a, a, a sense of kind of what Harvard means globally and, and what it means to be a student athlete here without beating them over the head with it. Like, oh my God, you should be genuflecting in front of the John Harvard statue every day, every time you walk in, in Harvard yard. But I, th I think that that humility and that gratitude is a hallmark of our program, that there's an element of pride, that there is a strong sense of that there's a, like a, there's a phalanx of 20 to 30 people that helped you get here, including your parents and your teachers and your coaches. And not that you owe them, but they're kind of with you because you didn't get here by yourself. Nobody did. And so that's really a foundational feeling here. And I think it helps govern how hard they practice and how well they're doing in school and their, their drive to be, you know, great citizens of, uh, you know, of campus and, you know, what they're going to do with their professional lives. We talk about all that stuff and, um, you know, but my, I, I think a really cool moment was, you know, I'm going to my bagel shop, uh, you know, black shout out black sheep bagels in Cambridge and, and like five people on the morning of the BU game, like wished me, wished us luck. And, you know, and, you know, this is a place that I frequent and, and our guys know that we want to be connected with, the people who are connected to us. So we, you know, the team has a bunch of delis and breakfast places and coffee spots and, and, and we frequent them and they, they know our staff and they know our players and not for, not for any sort of adulation, but just to be really connected with the roots of, of Harvard and, and, and the retailers and the businesses that are in Harvard square. So that was super cool. Cause that was the first time that had happened. It's nice when you're winning, but it's also nice that they're recognizing that our, that our team is making, you know, a transformation that we're heading in the right direction. That's cool, man. And you mentioned Harvard, like there are only a handful of schools like across the whole country where just tourists from all over just want to see it. And you're in one of those places. Every time I run by it, it's, it's something special. So it, it, I think that all sinks in and it's pretty cool when you have a chance to be immersed in that. I think it's a great lesson for the kids. That's a hundred, there's a hundred percent. Like you think there's, you know, 70,000 people didn't get into Harvard. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Jeez. so you you can never be too far away from that sense of humility around it, and all the people who helped that get you here. But also, okay, now what are my responsibilities as a, a member of our team community of the of the house and the yard uh, community, the the greater heart? Like that comes with responsibilities. You know, you don't even know these other seventy thousand people who unfortunately didn't get in, but like you have to almost honor them in some way by being a really good student, working really hard, being a good citizen, being a good member of our community. And that 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 kind of humility and appreciation is, is a theme for us. Um, and it helps, I think, really govern great decisions about their schoolwork and, and the pride they take into that and the sacrifices that their parents and and the major influencers in their lives have had on them. And it's the least that you can do. And really it's not that hard. And, and they constantly are walking across, you know, it sounds like you run in this area. Anderson bridge is the bridge that connects Harvard, uh, Harvard square and, and the athletic campus. And they're going to walk over that bridge a thousand times in their time here. And they should, they should get to the crest of that hill. And, and whether it's looking at Dylan field house where our locker room is, uh, which is the red cupola, or looking back toward the square and the, and the river houses, life's pretty good. Even on, even on a bad rainy day like today, life's pretty good. I'm a student athlete at Harvard and we're heading in the right direction and they're playing hard, gritty, tough. And so 
Yeah, I can't wait to find out where this is going to go. Yeah, uh, so are we. It's uh, always a pleasure and a privilege talking to you, Coach Jerry Byrne. Um, and good luck this weekend. You got Dartmouth on Saturday. So we will be watching. And uh, thanks again for the time. Thank you, fellas. All right, great hearing from Coach Byrne, Taylor Moreno in a moment. Well, we got to make our quick picks first. A lot of good matchups across yeah. the country here. I'll start here with a game on Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern time. So if you're kick off your weekend, you kick off your weekend with some lacrosse. Denver Drexel in San Diego. So a little oh. spring break action going on Love out there it. out west for the Drexel Dragons and company as well. So Denver comes into this one eight and one. Drexel five and four. Denver hasn't played in a couple weeks. March fifteenth against Fairfield was the last time they played. They that was coming off that nine eight win over Michigan. A nice win at that for Denver. B Barons ten points against Fairfield. Sam Thacker was one of the players of the week. I think USA Lacrosse. She has thirty one caused turnovers this season. She's been really good on the defensive side. They take on a team in Drexel. It was really intriguing. We did their game on Sunday in which they had that momentous comeback calling, falling. I, you can't say just short because they took the lead You're going on Drexel? an 8-0 run in that game. And Drexel then now goes out west, just won an overtime game. They sort of recovered from that against San Diego State University. Carson Harris had a huge goal. Seven seconds to go to tie that one to force overtime. I'm taking the Dragons against really? Denver out west. I think the Dragons have played a tougher schedule, certainly, and I think they're a little more battle test than Denver at this point in the season. Denver played Boston College. Drexel also won 25 draws in that game against San Diego State. They dominated that. They turned it over 17 times. If they can go and control the draw control circle and minimize those okay. turnovers, I think they can play with a lot of teams in this country. That's what they did against Florida in the second half. That's why they went on that run. And I think they're starting to find the rhythm there um, and the circle, most importantly, because okay. that is where they were able to make that run against Florida when they won a bunch of draws. I think they can do it against Denver as well. I am going to pick in a high-scoring battle, 15-14. Drexel gets the win out west. One thing I can guarantee, that uh, temperature being too cold will not be an issue in it that will, game. It will not. It's That's true. Good. I mean, That's a good thing It for is going to be 80 degrees in Denver this weekend. They're not playing in Denver, <laughs> but it's going to be 80 degrees, like two weeks after the three-degree day. Probably, it could have been like yeah, 24 they, they hours I after. understand Denver played Boston College, but yeah, I'm just okay. saying that right. the other, some of the other teams, I think Drexel as of late is a little bit more. They, they've had some close games, some close affairs. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go a stand out west. Stanford at Colorado. Stanford, I think, has figured this thing out. Uh, and I'm really? Gonna, yeah, I'm going to go with Stanford coming off the overtime win over USC. Also beat Arizona State last weekend. So I got Stanford to kick off the weekend at Colorado with a 13-10 win. Uh, they've won four straight, the Cardinal. And Ashley Humphrey, we keep talking about her. She has been terrific. Second in the country with over six points per game so far this year. She's got five straight games as a redshirt freshman. Five straight games of six or more points. I think she keeps it rolling. All right, uh, moving on. We have now USC at Arizona State, 6 p.m. Eastern Friday. More Friday lacrosse for you. USC coming off that loss to Stanford yep. in overtime. And I think that this is a nice bounce back opportunity for them against an Arizona State team who's pretty feisty. I think they're going to keep it pretty close in this one. USC's Kelsey Huff, 32 goals, 10 caused turnovers, 12 ground balls for them this year, filling up the box score. Arizona State had a nice bounce back against Cal after the loss to Stanford last Friday. And Emily Glagolev, graduate attacker, yeah. six goals, three assists against Colorado, five goals and assists against Stanford, three goals, seven assists against Cal. She is feeling it. So I'm going to lean the other way of USC. I just think that USC, after a couple of, uh, you know, interesting decisions, if you will, against Stanford and Arizona State, had maybe had their moment of the season already against Colorado. Right? Yeah, that was they, a big win for I, the Sun I, I might have helped make them a little more competitive moving forward. It's just tough, you know, to go out and, and win games like that on a weekly basis. 14-12 USC. All right. Uh, let's go to the Big Ten. A little bit colder in Big Ten country. Northwestern at Michigan. I, I really like the Wolverines, but I just think the Wildcats have too much offensively. And, and you look at what this Northwestern team has done this year. Their only losses are North Carolina and Boston College. They got wins over Notre Dame, Syracuse, and Stony Brook. And in all of those games, they've looked really good offensively. I think that continues. Lauren Gilbert, 10th in the country with more than five points per game. I mean, look, I, obviously uh, they miss not having uh, their star in, in, in there for Northwestern, but they, they're starting to figure it out. And uh, I think they 
I can't wait for them to face Maryland because I think that's going to be a terrific matchup here in the Big Ten. I think they're the top two in the league. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, they've reinvented themselves a bit without Izzy Skating yeah. there with, with Lauren Gilbert and Leah Holmes and company, and, and they've been able to remake themselves and, and do a really good team. Um, is this game at Northwestern or Michigan? At Michigan. It is in Ann Arbor. Yeah. I, don't, I think it might be a little closer than 18-13. I don't know. I, I like this Northwestern team. I think they yeah, run, they're, they're run good. Gun. Absolutely. All right, moving on. Hofstra at UConn, 1 p.m. on on Saturday, I got Hofstra in this You've game. You got Hofstra. I'm, I'm riding. I'm riding right. Hofstra because uh, you know they they've also played a really tough schedule. I talked about that with Drexel, but Hofstra has also played a tough one. They've lost their last two to Stony Brook and um, Vanderbilt. Alexa Matera didn't score against Stony Brook. She comes out with five goals, two assists against Vandy. Jess Smith also had 12 saves against Vanderbilt. She's had a really nice senior year after a couple of lower down years again in the since her great freshman year. She came out and was really good. So she's played really well, and they're going to need her to play well. UConn, 10th best shooting percentage in the country, 48.4% with Sydney Watson, Leela Laprise leading the way there. So they've got some good offense, UConn, but I like what uh, Hofstra, I like their schedule and how battle-tested they are. I think the last couple games are going to help them for situations like this one. UConn having a great start to their season first yeah. seven and one start since 2016 i think hofstra just is going to be a little bit too much for them in this one 11 10 is the final there. that'd be a huge win for the pride big yeah. win for the caa too if they can get that one um all right let's go back to the big 10 penn state at ohio state this nittany lions team um maybe a little quiet to start the year but they've started to turn it on they got a win over james madison uh my wife is also a penn stater so i'm pretty sure that when i married her i'm not legally allowed to pick Ohio State against Penn State. I don't know. Wow. I'm just I'm looking out for number one. So I'm going with the Nittany Lions in this one. They're coming off a tight loss to Princeton 12 to 11 last weekend. But the reigning Big Ten freshman of the year, Kristen O'Neill, has been terrific so far. Already 23 goals this year. She had 29 all of last year as a freshman. She's got 23, six assists. And uh, Megan Murray. Coming off a terrific game against Princeton, despite that loss, she had nine draw controls. That is far more than she's had in any game this year. Also had three goals. I think this it's a Nittany Lions team. It's maybe a little bit younger when you look at O'Neal leading the way as just a sophomore. But they're starting to figure some stuff out against some good teams. That James Madison win uh, really stands out. They challenge Princeton. So I, I, th I give them the edge over, over Ohio State. All right, Johns Hopkins at Rutgers. We stay in the Big Ten here. 5 p.m. Saturday is that game. I am leading the way of the Blue Jays. Johns Hopkins, 13 to 10. I know Rutgers off to a great start. They're 8 yeah. 1. Hopkins has played a really tough schedule. They have wins over Penn and Drexel, an OT loss against Navy, and a two goal loss against Michigan. That says a lot to me. The grad student, GN, Chris is really playing well. 14 caused turnovers in her last five games played, doing well in the defensive end. And I think that Rutgers is going to run into maybe one of the better teams they've played all season long in Johns Hopkins in this one. 13 to 10 Hopkins. All right, let's finish up in the ACC. This is a really intriguing game for me. Duke at Notre Dame. And I think... As close as it feels like this is, I think it's going to be that close. I give the Blue Devils a slight edge, 16-15. I think this is a shootout. Notre Dame has won three of their last four, including a runaway win against a good Jacksonville team. 20-5, uh, to five, I think, was that final. Jeez. But wow. Duke just has too much offensively. They've got two of the top 12 scorers in the country. And Cat Berry at six points per game. She's third. Katie DeSimone, now 12th in the country, just over five points per game. As a team, they're number one, almost 20 goals per game. And I know some of that's inflated with some of their schedule, and they're putting up 22, 23 goals in some of these mid Scored a lot games. of goals on Syracuse. Yeah, but exactly. I, I do think they can get it done yeah. against good teams. And so I think this is a shootout. I think the fact that it's in – um, South Bend gives Notre Dame a shot. I think that's why this thing's back and forth, but I give Duke the edge. Yeah, I kind of trust Notre Dame at home more than anything else, especially in a game like this. Yeah. Especially with the expectations they had so going you like into the this Irish? year. I kind of like the Irish. Okay. Yeah, I'm, all I'm right, go for feeling, it. I'm, I guess I'm feeling upsets this weekend. I'm, yeah, I don't know you why. are feeling frisky. I'm all over. I'm all over Holy the upsets. Cow. Um, yeah, so uh, mm. anyway. Yeah, um, no upset this week when North Carolina knocked off High Point. It was – Interesting early, though. And then the tornado warning hit. And, and then, then the North Tar Heels hit. Carolina <laughs> yeah, thank goodness everybody was okay. On the road, yeah. yeah. Uh, Carolina with a big win in the middle of the week. Obviously coming off a big win over Boston College on Sunday. Prior to that game against High Point, I had a chance to catch up with goalie Taylor Moreno talking about that BC game and this season so far. 
So we have Taylor Moreno, the North Carolina goalie, joining us now. Taylor, just sum up what Sunday was like. Um, I mean, Sunday was just surreal with the amount of people that were there, the hype level of the game, and obviously playing a great opponent. It was just an overall ridiculous experience, and I think our team really just enjoyed ourselves. It was a great way to end our spring break. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you've played at the, the highest level here of Division One lacrosse. What do you compare that regular season atmosphere to? I literally have been telling everybody it literally felt like it was a national championship game. Like the amount of people, the roars, the the stadium was shaking every time um, somebody scored. And it was just awesome. The way that they kind of hyped up the game leading into it was also awesome. So it was just overall a ridiculous experience. And I, and I honestly compared that to a national championship. Yeah, and it helps that you won this one, right? <laughs> yes, definitely felt a little bit better for sure. The, the game and it swings and the momentum and it looks like I mean at one point in the fourth quarter I almost turned it off because it felt like you guys were had it in control and then Boston College finishes on that run what's your main takeaway as a team of the fact that you won but you let BC get right back into it and make things really interesting down the stretch yeah I think it's just a testament to obviously lacrosse being a game of momentum shifts and at the end of the day it's going to challenge us to see how well we can handle that and how well we can adjust and I think it also just goes to show how much we can still work on and how much we can improve as a team. And I think going back to Chapel Hill and kind of reassessing how the game went for us, we we obviously know that there are a lot of things that we can get, get better on and, better, and improve on, especially coming into the second half of the season. And hopefully those will be things that we can take care of that will um, help get us through Memorial Day weekend. What kind of momentum has there been this year, especially all the players that have come back from the team that had the heartbreak of last year's semifinals? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of a redemption game for us. We obviously know it was regular season and it's definitely a way for us to kind of gauge where we stand in comparison to them and for them to kind of learn more about themselves as well. But for us, it was definitely going in there with a little bit of not really anger, frustration, but obviously we want to come out and, and redeem ourselves from that final four game. So I think it was awesome for us to kind of come out here and, um, challenge ourselves to see where we stand and at the end of the day like a lot of the people who we are transfers that we got in and the different personnel shifts we've had based on people being hurt um was kind of a testament to how well that we can adjust to that and see how well we we line up with a lot of these teams that we've been seeing this year so i think bc was just a great test for us and it was an awesome learning experience for our team you mentioned the transfers what's been the secret of players like you who've been there your whole career five years to welcoming in some of these really talented players, obviously, but kind of welcoming them in and making them feel part of the Tar Heel family because it feels like things click almost immediately for some of these players. Yeah, no, it's they've been awesome, and I think they've been a great addition to our team. And Andy Aldave, Sam Geisbeck, and Olivia Dirks, they really have stepped up, and they've meshed really, really well with our offense, our midfield, and our defense. So to kind of see them come in here and just immediately get along with everyone on the team and just – essentially fill in the voids that we lost in Katie Hogue. Um, I think it's been awesome for us to kind of get different people involved. And it's really shown that we can have multiple different goal scorers and it's not just relying on two people anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I go up and down your lineup offensively and I can't imagine what it's like for defense. You face this group in practice. What's it like to face your offense in practice? It's tough. And I obviously think our defense makes them better and our offense makes our defense better. So um, certainly makes my job a lot harder, but it also is a great opportunity for me to get better. And I think going against them every day in practice, they continuously challenge me. They challenge our defensive unit and vice versa. So I think that's really what's going to hopefully help push us past, you know, our regular season and into the post season. And, and we're, we're very hopeful and um, excited for what that may look like. You have a lot of talented scorers on your team, but I'm not sure there's anybody in the country that shoots the ball like Charlotte North, especially off the free position. When Take me inside your mind. When she's doing the wind-up and you're staring it down, like what's going through your head? Yeah, I mean, watched a lot, a lot of film to try to see if there's any way to kind of gauge where we think it might be going. But at the end of the day, when she's winding up like that, she does a great job of hiding the ball. So at the moment the whistle blows, like you get a quick glimpse of the ball and you're just kind of bracing for impact. So um, kudos to any goalie that manages to get a piece of it or manages to make a save on an eight meter. Like 
it is it is definitely tough um and definitely taking that one off the face was uh was pretty funny she actually hit me so hard it knocked the uh chin strap buckle off my helmet which is why i was bent over i was trying to get it back in um but yeah so she's obviously a great player and she's just ridiculously good and at the end of the game at the end of the game we like walked up to each other and she's like damn i hate playing against her. and i go yes yeah, same here so don't worry about it um i actually I actually got a gnarly bruise on the inside of my leg from her, uh, from that game. So I sent her a picture and she was like, Oh my God, that's so bad. And I'm like reason million and one, why I hate playing against you. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I give you tons of credit because I don't think I would in a million years would stand in front of that shot. Yeah, it's definitely tough. I mean, even guys on our men's lacrosse team, they're like, that shot's just ridiculous. Like it is the equivalent of a men's shot. Just, and it's crazy too, because like in men's, you know, they're seeing them from probably eight outside of our eight meter. And now you're setting her up for basically a layup with a rip off the eight meter. It's just, it's tough. Yeah, I, I almost feel like it's like trying to hit in a hundred mile per hour fastball where you almost have to just kind of guess where it's going to be. And then you just take your best shot. Is that, is that like the strategy? I would say partially that, but it's also, you're, you're definitely trying to stare that ball down and read it. It's just like, she, she is really, really good at hiding it. <laughs> Well, uh, you're a, a pretty tough person, like personally. You're a black belt in Taekwondo, is, is that correct? Uh, yes, it is. What What was the pro? Like, when did you get into Taekwondo, and like, when did you become a black belt? Um, so it was me, my brother, and my sister essentially started because my parents wanted us to be able to defend ourselves. So that was really the main goal of it. Um, and then we kind of just stuck with it. And I actually got it. I think it was either between. I think it was going into my freshman year of high school is when I got my black belt. So, um, and then once I kind of hit that and we started hitting high school sports, that's kind of where I was like, I kind of had to walk away from it, which was honestly fine. I mean, at some point it's, it's obviously an awesome skill to have. And, um, you know, I could do a couple of cool kicks or whatever, but, um, nothing too crazy, but I definitely think it kind of shows a little bit in how I play just the leg flares or stuff like that. And it was a great way to kind of work on like hand-eye coordination and all that kind of stuff. But, um, Definitely don't miss it too much. It was definitely uh, crazy and it was a lot of work. So once we kind of hit the high school sports, it had to get pushed off to the side. Well, and I feel like it has to help your mentality too, like just the structure and the, the determination of being like one on, like that's just you, right? Oh yeah, 100%. I definitely think it was um, very, very structured and it's very like straightforward. And um, it was actually really funny doing a lot of the classes with my sister and her and I just getting super, super competitive because we're only 15 months apart from each other. So she's a year younger than me, but um, we would just get so competitive and we'd always get paired up with each other and find ourselves being partners for stuff. So we're over there kicking pads and one person holding it, seeing how hard we can kick each other with it. So um, it was, it was pretty awesome. And they also had like different classes too, like sparring and stuff. So like, you're actually like sitting there, like essentially boxing another person. So, um, that was also a lot of fun. But taking a Charlotte North shot to like the leg is still worse. Doesn't compare. <laughs> it honestly reminds me of like watching MMA fighters and then getting just continuously kicked in the same spot in the leg. Um, that's essentially what it reminded me of. And that's probably what it looks like. It looks like I got hit with a baseball bat <laughs> on the inside of the leg. <laughs> That is, I'm sorry, that's awful. I, you, fifth year on campus, what's it like and how different is it from when you first walked on campus there in Chapel Hill as a freshman? So honestly, as sad as it is, I'm actually a sixth year. So it's oh, sixth six year, years sorry. On, no, you're good. No, six years on campus is definitely uh, hitting, hitting the max for me. I think, um, I think it's been awesome. I, I wouldn't have stayed, I think, had I not enjoyed being in Chapel Hill as much as I do and being around the people that are on my team. So I'm super thankful to have gotten another opportunity to play one last season with these girls and obviously be in an amazing place. I mean, can't beat the weather, can't beat any of that stuff. So, um, and it's also just nice being around, not even like my teammates, but other girls on other teams that, that I'm pretty close friends with. So it's nice to just kind of be able to hang out for one more, one more year. Yeah, you've had the opportunity to do some really cool stuff out off the lacrosse field there. I, I've seen all the, the stuff with uh, your designs and the mural that you've painted at Doran's Field. What was that moment like when uh, Coach Levy told you, hey, like, this is yours. Go take a stab at this in, the, in this brand new, beautiful facility that you guys have? Yeah, no, it was definitely an intimidating process. I've never done anything that big. So to kind of have her be like, all right, so this is kind of what I'm envisioning make it happen. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do my very best. And that it was like a 16 foot by 16 foot wall. So 
Um, the field guys definitely helped me out, giving me some supplies, of a nice big ladder. Um, and it was nice because the motto that was on the wall that we get to um, was brought to us by Desi, who was uh, one of my teammates, Maddie Hoffer's coaches when she was in high school. So it was definitely something that not only hit close to her and I, but it hit close to the rest of our team. And um, I actually had her come and help me finish off the rest of the wall towards the end of it. Um, so it was really nice. It was me, her and our friend, Jill Shippey, who's on our track team, um, kind of sitting there. I was helping, having them help me paint the end. And we were literally sitting in our locker room waiting for the paint to dry because they were so excited to see what it was going to look like afterwards. So um, that was also really nice. And it was nice to see, you know, art bringing not only me and my teammates closer together, but to also bring something that means so much to all of us um, to just be something that we look at every time we walk out for a home game. Yeah, that's so special and such a, a cool kind of almost like lasting thing you can leave at, at your school. It's it's kind of the dream. I, I know this goes back to your family in terms of growing up and with people who are artistic and, and design driven. What's the what would be the dream thing you, that you could design? Because I know you've done some shooting shirts for the team. Like what would be the, the dream thing you haven't done yet? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I've kind of dabbled in a lot of different mediums in terms of art whether it be canvas paintings or graphic design or anything like that so um, I really do enjoy painting on like sneakers and stuff I do a lot of the game day shoots for my teammates so I mean in an ideal world I would love to be still doing something along those lines um, post-college but obviously um, I think it's going to continue to be a little bit more of a side thing for me um, but I definitely want to make sure that I'm still maintaining it because just like lacrosse it's art is still something you have to practice and get better at so um, definitely hoping to you know, keep that in my repertoire going forward. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really, it's really, really cool. And the stuff I've seen is incredible. So keep up the good work there. I, one of my favorite notes in one of the articles that you gave a quote about was that you were a Jets fan growing up, but then you decided to switch to the Giants. With the struggles of both, have you decided that you should just scrap it all together? Yeah, you know, it's definitely tough. I'm hoping that both teams can kind of turn it around. Um, but yeah, no, growing up, I used to watch football with my dad every Sunday. Um, and I could never understand any of the things he was yelling at the TV or anything like that until I obviously got older and I learned more of the game. But um, he always said he's he's a diehard Jets fan, but obviously roots for both teams. But at the end of the day, he was like, if at some point they end up playing each other, he goes, I'm rooting for the Jets. So um so that's kind of where that comes from, for sure. <laughs> yeah, try to figure out somebody to figure it out up there, and and then you can go that way. You and you pl and you played football. When when did you decide you wanted to kick? Um. So in high school, uh, playing goalie, I obviously had the responsibility of taking goal kicks and going into it. I had never actually like officially played soccer goalie before. It was mainly I was always a forward, and so the opportunity arose for me to go try that out. And so one of the things I really struggled with was accurately kicking the soccer ball where I wanted it to go as far as I wanted it to go. So I worked a lot with actually one of my sixth grade science teachers, um, who was the coach of our high school boys team. So he kind of helped me out. And at the end of the day, that season, we had basically what ended up happening was I would be taking every single one of our free kicks that was either like by the 50 yard line or anything like that. And I ended up scoring one of our game winning goals as a goalie within like 10 seconds left of the game. I had an assist. So it was honestly wild. And our football coaches at first were joking around. They're like, you know, we're losing our, our kicker next year. Like, why don't you come try it out? And I was like, yeah, you guys are really funny. And then preseason in the summer rolled around and they were like, no, actually, I think we need you to come help us out. Um, so they just kind of gave me basically a week of trying to teach me how to properly kick a football. Cause it's definitely different than kicking a soccer ball, but um, once I kind of rolled around, they obviously wanted to play the cards right and protect me as much as they could. So I only kicked the PATs, um, but it was a lot of, lot of fun. And we joked around because my brother was also on the football team. And so you get stickers for every six points you score. And we would joke around and be like, I had more stickers than my brother did. And he played football for like three years in high school. So um, that was hysterical. And it's always a joke in my family now. Yeah, no, it's it's great. And I tell you, like you're probably used to the helmet and the pads and stuff. So some of it probably wasn't even that much of an adjustment for you. Oh, yeah. No, I think playing lacrosse goalie was honestly the way I started. It was like I just got to put all the equipment on. I'm like, this is the closest I'm going to get to playing football. And then obviously once I started playing lacrosse goalie and then I got to play football, I'm like, oh, I'm so used to this. But I will tell you, football helmets are a lot heavier than lacrosse helmets are. Yeah, yeah. Those things are big and those shoulder pads, if, unless you can get the smallest ones, they're they're bulky as well. Oh, 100%, 100%.
uh, let's bring it back to lacrosse here because you check off the big one. You, you knock off Boston College. You guys jump up to number one in the country. How do, and, and you as a veteran leader, how do you keep everybody focused toward what the ultimate goal is when you head toward May throughout the rest of this regular season? Yeah, I think it reminds me a lot of 2018 when we took down Maryland in OT and then went out the next game and unfortunately lost to Florida. So it's definitely uh, a point in our season where we can't let up and we have to continuously play our game and continuously improve on, you know, our style and our skills and whatnot and not let up no matter who our opponent is. I think one of our big focuses this year is playing to our standard and not playing to anybody else's. So I think maintaining everyone's mentality and keeping that on track will be really, really important. And hopefully that'll be something that we can um, keep reminding ourselves throughout the rest of the season. Well, uh, Taylor, it's been fun to watch you guys play so far. Congratulations on the big one Sunday. We'll catch up sometime down the road and uh, good luck here the rest of the way. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Great to catch up with Taylor Moreno. I, I think maybe one of the most interesting goalies in all of college lacrosse. And that says a lot for a goalie. It does. We're all very interesting, interesting people. Yes. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, all right, let's move on. Some big news with the Premier Lacrosse League this week announcing their new broadcast rights deal with ESPN, a multi-year deal. They'll have games on ESPN+, Plus, ESPN, ESPN2, and ABC. But other news as well. Yeah, um, there are some reports that have, have come out in a variety of sources that say that the PLL, the contracts these players are signing, will prohibit them from playing in summer box leagues like the MSL, the WLA. And we know a lot of those guys that maybe play in the NLL also go and do that and play for the Man Cup, if you will. That's an example there um, of something they, accordingly to some of these sources, would not be able to do, which I think is really interesting, Travis, and, and that the PLL is trying to, to keep their guys and maybe these groups together in just one fashion, in one league over the course of the summer. And where routinely they would go and back and forth and do both. Well, it makes sense. I mean, if you're the PLL, you're trying to take the game to a different level. And you are paying more these players more than they've ever made before. Now, it, it's maybe not what the players want to make and to make them completely full-time lacrosse players, but it's more than they've made before. And so they're saying, all right, we're making more of an investment than any other league has made in the past, and so we expect something in return. And in return, we expect that during our season in the summer, we are the league you are playing in. We've, we're doing all these different things for you as a player, and so this is what you give us in return. And, I mean, let's be honest, like, what are the players going to choose? And it, I mean, you're talking about Canadian players for the most part here because it's almost all Canadians yeah. that are playing in these summer box leagues. What are you going to choose? And I, it seems as though a majority of the Canadian players that are at least stars or consistent players in the PLL are going to pick the PLL field. I think it's... I'm not a fan of it. I understand what you're saying and, and why they would move to do this. Of course, you think of injury. You think of guys and their availability, depending on yeah. the weekend and where that all lands. I, I completely understand that. It, just, it feels like maybe this was something that you do a few years down the road. And, and I know that you when know, we talked to, to Paul Rabel and everybody else at the beginning, they wanted everybody to be full-time lacrosse players. And I don't think that's been realized yet. I mean, from what I understand and what most people understand about how, what these guys are being paid on a yearly basis, that is not enough to support somebody from one league to be a full-time lacrosse player. So they have to go to other places, other leagues to go. And, and if they want to do that and just play lacrosse, to be able to make a living for themselves. So I think by restricting them, it's a, it's a slippery slope but, be, because you look at, at the, in that angle, and if I can continue just one second, yeah. is that – I, there's that perception of the fact that the, the PLL hasn't really acknowledged the NLL. And you hear... Yeah, but they're letting them that, play in the NLL. They're not I saying do. that you can't play in the other professional league that's True. happening. And it, but at the same time, this, the whole feel of the box game and the, for a lot of these guys, this is just a way of life. And a lot of guys, this is where the, this is how they grew up playing the box game. Then pick in, playing in, the box in, game in the fall and the summer. Then and that's the decision they're going to have to make. Look, yeah, yeah, you're forcing them to make that because, decision, which in, in turn can make the PLL a little weaker. Because I'd imagine guys no, but, are going to be. But let's go be honest. And, and play like, in the MSL. We had nine major league lacrosse teams before, and there was more talent than the nine teams that were there. Like the talent is not the issue no. for the Premier Lacrosse League. They've got more than enough talent to fill the rosters they have, and then some. Like they've got. Extra teams they can add in the next couple of years. And there are plenty of talented players. We're talking about college lacrosse drafts here of guys that are legit talents. That, like, maybe six of them are playing on the field. 
but you shouldn't be penalizing the Canadian guys. To, to well, say this to you're not, guys I don't think to, you're penalizing them. I think you're making them make a choice. Do you want to play field lacrosse in the summer, or do you want to play box just like you do in the winter? But for some, that decision is a financial one, too. Okay, then and, pick and where you're going to make more if money. If you're going to go and not play for a team you've played for your entire life, and don't forget, there's junior teams tied in with these MSL teams yeah. as well, that's a lot to give up for a lot of people that make their home in Canada and do all that there to, to go and, and play in this league that pays you, but you know, a good amount of change, good amount of cash. We don't know. So, I mean, I they I'd, don't play in it. I'd appreciate that. I, like I, I, I support it. And I think this, the summer box thing and the, the man cup obviously has such terrific prestige and it is it's an, got a lot more history and than it's the an, PLL yeah, does. It does. And it's an incredible <laughs> honor to win it. And the history there is unbelievable. But if you want to play field lacrosse on this stage and you want to grow your brand and be in front of the eyeballs that the PLL is going to be in front of, which is more than you're going to get in playing for the Man Cup, unfortunately, in their case. I mean, like, in the United States, yes. No, in, in Canada, too. The Man Cup's not broadcast on national television in Canada. I mean, the, the select number of games in the PL will be broadcast on national television and, and digital. That's, we, don't, more, we don't know how many games right, will be broadcast yeah, but, nationally. But what I'm saying is it's, it's a handful of games you make will a be choice. broadcast for a lot of people to but see. But, like, at, at the end of the day, if a guy who says his star, like, you have the the best Canadian. Say Lyle Thompson is playing in the trying to play for a uh, in for his team uh, up in up in Canada, and gets hurt. And one of the star players can't play the rest of the year in the PLL for the Boston or for excuse me the the Cannons Lacrosse Club. And the announcers have to say, oh well, he was hurt playing north of the border. That's a horrendous look. Like, we're not even talking about, like, the WNBA players, because we were talking about this before. They go play internationally, yeah. but it's the off season, So at least there is a – There, okay, there is a separation. It's, so it's, it's the, a it, different season. So You're it's right. the NLL and PLO thing. I think that's fine. It's when it's the crossover of seasons that it becomes an I, issue. I just – I don't – I think, like I said, in a few years, yes, I think this is perfectly to put on the table – I just don't think the league is there yet. And well, I, why can't you start it now? Be, because, because there's what, not enough money to go around for some of these guys. Then, I mean, and all these guys have other jobs anyway. They're making more money in the PLO than they ever did before. They are making more money so, than they did so before. It's still not enough to support them well, as yeah, a but that's also their PLL that's, lacrosse player. That's, you're, their, you're, that's you're kind what of forcing their hand to make you that thing that isn't right well, now Well, what if the league just didn't reality. exist? Then they couldn't make the money anyway. Well, yes, that is a true concept. <laughs> so, <laughs> the but the league it. doesn't exist if you don't have the players healthy and performing on the field. That's what they're trying to protect. They're trying to protect their product. I, I feel for them. Shh. But, like, you've got to make a choice. Because, I mean, like, what are you going to – like, how can you expect – I mean, they're playing summer box games on Sundays and Mondays, and the PLL is playing games on Sundays. What if a guy decides, oh, you know what, I'm going to play my summer box game on Sunday instead of playing in the PLL? What, what, I mean, what do you, if you're a coach in the league, what do you do? Well, I think that that should then be, if that's a decision that would have you're to be made. You're making different caveats. You a, just got to. That is a conversation for those coaches and those teams to adjudicate and, and say, well, is this, I, I don't think it just be a blanket you can't play. Maybe that's something a conversation a coach would have with a guy and say, well, you know, this one is going to prioritize this in this situation. And that way you at least give them an option of going back to do that with their home club or what it might be. And, we have, and have that conversation before the season instead of just saying, nope, nobody can do this ever. Instead, you actually have these teams operate as individual clubs, which you don't have enough of, in my estimation. You have the coach as the GM and then the whole blanket of the league that's sort of overseeing, got their hands in everything. I would love it if the, each club would, would or each coach could say, okay, you know, Zach courier he's available and he decided to do this and he's the one who's gonna i just think it should be up to the actual player and if that impacts the team in a negative way that's how you deal with that well internally. it is i mean it is up to the individual player they can choose not to play in the pll well, i yeah then that's a, that would be a very difficult thing for some of these guys that were stars in canada and are stars here and now they're gonna have to choose between one or the other and that will lose uh, that will impact the fan base of people that are love to watch these guys whether like, that's in Canada or well, here in the United I States. I mean people in Canada are still going to watch the players in the PLL and they're still going to watch them in the NLL and quite frankly like the attendance and the viewership and everything for the games that have been uh, in summer box haven't been that good anyway. The allegiance to some of those yeah, teams I, you know in Canada is a lot more than any allegiance anybody has to any of these teams or players in the PLL. About making money. I know. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that's why I understand it. Like just, I told you at the beginning of my argument, I get it. I completely understand. Doesn't mean I have to like it. Yeah. Okay.
You can like it. I don't have to. I just, I just get it. Like at the end of the day, they got to look out for number one. They, League. they do. Yes, they do. That is so the, the players can priority. too. If they want to play summer box, they can. And, and they just can't play in the POL. And I will. I'll be fascinated to see what decisions they make. I mean, a bunch of them have decided to play in the PLL. I understand that, and and it's unfortunate for some of those teams in the, in Canada that yeah. they're not going to be able to play for. It's a bummer. It is. But let's let's be honest. Like that was originally an amateur. That the idea behind that was the amateur championship of Canada. If these guys are pros and they're playing in the amateur championship of Canada, is it still the same as it was meant to be? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. But that's a fine question. And on, on that, that note, note <laughs> as Dylan, our producer, says in our ear, we'll leave you on that cheery thought of, <laughs> of controversy going on in the pro game. Yeah. Just want everyone to get on the same page, you know, uh, and, you yeah, know you in one way, shape, or form. Got a lot at of... least the NLL and the PLL don't overlap, I guess. If you're looking at two Not of the much. biggest uh, leagues of lacrosse that we have here um, right now as it currently stands, at least they don't intersect. And, and that's a good thing. So there you go. There's your positive note of the day. All right. That's all the time we've got. Uh, I think we went over the time we've got, but thanks for listening or watching. He's Tom. I'm Travis. We'll see you right back here on Tuesday to recap the weekend in college lacrosse.